All right, so you sent us down the rabbit hole with uh, some Feynman on relativity for this deep dive. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because relativity is one of those things that, you know, everybody thinks they get. Right. Like, oh, yeah, everything's relative. Time is wibbly wobbly. Yeah, yeah. I took a philosophy class. Exactly. But uh, but it's getting past those cliches that uh, where it gets really juicy. It's like that thing, like, I did a juice cleanse. Right. Like, that sounds impressive until you realize it mostly means not eating solid foods for three days. Exactly. We're here for the real relativity smoothie with all the fiber of actual physics. I love it. And luckily, we've got Feynman, who is... Uh, famous for making even the densest topics uh, a breeze. Yes. So we are cracking open chapter 16 of his lectures all about energy uh, and momentum in Einstein's world. And buckle up because these aren't just like theoretical brain teasers. Right. We're talking about the kind of stuff that helps us understand why energy itself actually has weight and how that plays out in things like, well, the atomic bomb. For starters. Okay, now that's a deep dive. But before we get ahead of ourselves, I love how Feynman starts off. He uh, he doesn't mince words about those folks who toss around everything is relative after one too many cocktails. Oh, yeah. He calls them cocktail party philosophers, which I think perfectly captures that like vague air of profundity yes. without any of the actual substance. Right. And when he really drives home is that relativity isn't some philosophical pondering. Right. It's a rigorous framework yeah, based on experiments with uh, tangible, sometimes bizarre implications. Uh -huh. It makes specific predictions that we can actually test. Absolutely. And a classic litmus test is the speed of light. Imagine someone's like claiming that relativity is self-evident. Right. Ask them this. If you're in a car speeding at, say, 100,000 miles per second, okay. and you switch on your headlights, does the light travel at the speed of light plus the car's speed? Now, common sense might say yes, but... Relativity says, nope. Mm -hmm. The speed of light is constant. It doesn't matter how fast the source of the light is moving. Light always travels at the speed of light. Right. Even to an observer standing still. It's wild. That's a real head scratcher for people. Yeah, it really highlights how our everyday intuitions can lead us astray. Totally. Especially when we're talking about things moving at, well, the speed of light. Yeah. Like, we tend to think of motion as relative, yeah. which makes sense in a lot of cases. Sure. You're on a train, another train passes by. Right. Hard to say who's actually moving. Exactly. And Feynman points out that while it's true, we can't detect uniform motion uh, in a straight line. Okay. Without an external point of reference, acceleration and rotation are different beasts altogether. Right. That's where his spinning room example comes in handy. Yes. Imagine you're in a room and suddenly you feel this force pulling you outward. You know you're rotating. Even if you can't see the outside world. Yeah. You feel it. Right. It's a much more visceral way to grasp the difference between those different kinds of motion. And it shows that not everything is relative. But here's where Feynman takes it a step further okay. and really throws us for a loop. He argues that even the concept of rotation on a cosmic scale okay. gets influenced by the distant stars. Whoa, wait, what? The stars are affecting things here. That's not something uh, they teach you in high school physics. It's as if the distant stars act as a kind of fixed background, a cosmic reference frame. Okay. That plays a role in how rotation works on the grand scheme of things. That's one to ponder, yeah. for sure. Yeah. You start digging into relativity, and suddenly even the seemingly straightforward things get deliciously complex. That's it, yeah. Okay, so we've established that relativity really messes with our intuition, even when it comes to something as fundamental as rotation. But where it really gets wild is when we start talking about time. Ah, uh, yes. Time. Yeah, right. That slippery concept we all think we understand until relativity comes knocking. And there's no better example of this than the famous twin paradox. Right. The one that makes everyone's head spin. Yes. Yeah. Even physicists who claim to get it. So for our listeners who haven't plunged down this rabbit hole yet, how about we break it down? Absolutely. Let's imagine we have two twins. Let's call them Peter and Paul. Okay. Peter's perfectly content staying here on Earth. <laughs> but Paul, uh, well, he's always wanted to be an astronaut. Okay. So Paul hops into a spaceship and blasts off at a significant fraction of the speed of light. And here's where things get really interesting, because it's not just that Paul is moving really fast. It's what that speed does to time itself. Exactly. This is where the concept of time dilation comes in. Due to the mind-boggling nature of special relativity, Time actually slows down for Paul relative to Peter back on Earth. The faster Paul travels, 
the slower time runs for him. So it's like that thing we were talking about with the muons decaying slower at high speeds. Yes. But now it's not just some subatomic particle, it's a whole person experiencing time differently. Precisely. And to make it even wilder, it's not just clocks that are affected, it's time itself. Whoa. This means that Paul could be out there exploring the cosmos for what feels like a few years to him. Right. But when he returns to Earth, decades could have passed for Peter. Talk about an awkward family reunion. Right. Now, here's where the paradox part comes in. You might think, well, couldn't you also say that Peter is the one moving relative to Paul? Right. And from Paul's perspective, wouldn't it seem like time is slowing down for Peter? That's what always trips me up. It seems like it should work both ways. And this is where understanding the nuances of relativity is crucial. The key difference lies in acceleration. Remember how we talked about acceleration being different from uniform motion? Right. Well, Paul's spaceship has to accelerate to reach those incredible speeds and then decelerate to turn around and come back to Earth. Right. Peter, meanwhile, remains in a relatively constant reference frame. Ah, so it's not just about relative motion. It's about who experiences the changes in motion, the acceleration. Exactly. That breaks the symmetry. Exactly. It's those changes in velocity, those periods of acceleration and deceleration that create the asymmetry right. that leads to the time difference. Wow. That's a lot to wrap your head around. But it does make a certain kind of sense, even if it's completely counterintuitive to how we normally experience time. It is, isn't it? And while we haven't quite sent humans on relativistic round trips to confirm this with, like absolute certainty, right. we have observed these effects on a smaller scale right. with particles, like those muons we mentioned earlier, yeah. even muons that are forced into a curved path, experiencing acceleration, exhibit time dilation, right. just like those moving in a, str a straight line at high speed. So it's not just a theory. There's real world evidence to back it up. Exactly. That's both amazing and a little scary all at the same time. It is a bit of a mind bender, isn't it? And speaking of bending our minds, there's another consequence of relativity that Feynman dives into that I think you'll find fascinating. Oh, lay it on me. I'm ready for another dose of brain twisting physics. All right, then. Let's talk about what happens when you try to add velocities in the realm of relativity. Let's just say our everyday intuition doesn't quite cut it at speeds approaching the speed of light. I have a feeling things are about to get weird. Oh, you have no idea. See, in our normal everyday world, adding velocities seems pretty straightforward. Right. If you're on a train going 60 miles per hour and you throw a ball forward at 30 miles per hour, someone standing on the platform will see that ball moving at 90 miles per hour. You just add the speeds together. Right. Basic physics 101. Exactly. But when you start talking about objects moving at a significant fraction of the speed of light, okay. things get a lot more interesting. Let's use one of Feynman's examples. Okay. Imagine you're on a spaceship already traveling at, say, half the speed of light. Okay. Now you fire a projectile forward, and that projectile is moving at half the speed of light relative to the spaceship. Okay. You'd think, logically, that the projectile should now be traveling at the speed of light relative to a stationary observer back on Earth, right? That's what my gut is telling me. Yeah. Two halves make a whole, even at relativistic speeds. Right. Not so fast. Oh, okay. In the world of relativity, you can't simply add velocities directly. Oh, okay. Like you do at everyday speeds. It's more complicated than that. Okay, so how do you calculate it? Do we need to pull out a whiteboard and some complicated equations? While the full equation is a bit involved, the important thing to understand is that due to the way velocities combine in special relativity, okay. adding two speeds that are a significant fraction of the speed of light right. will never result in a speed equal to or greater than the speed of light itself. Wow. It's like there's this cosmic speed limit that nothing can break. So even though it feels like you should be able to just add those steeds together, the universe has other plans. Exactly. And to really drive the point home, Feynman points out something even more mind-boggling. Okay, hit me. Imagine you shine a beam of light from that same spaceship traveling at half the speed of light. Okay. Now, even though the spaceship is already moving incredibly fast, right. that light beam still travels at the speed of light relative to the observer on Earth. Wait, what? That just, how does that even... It doesn't seem to make sense based on our everyday experience because we're so used to light seemingly traveling at different speeds through different mediums like air versus water. Right, right. But the speed of light in a vacuum yeah. is constant regardless of the speed of the source emitting it. 
So no matter how fast you're moving, even at a significant fraction of the speed of light, you can never outspeed light itself. You got it. It's as if the universe has a built-in speed limit, and light always travels at that limit no matter what. It's a truly mind-bending concept. It really is. That challenges the very foundation of our understanding of motion and speed. Okay, you've officially blown my mind with that whole speed of light thing. Yeah. It's like the universe has a cheat code, and it's always set to maximum speed. Right. But... Uh, we were talking about Feynman. Yes. And I know we've got more ground to cover with him and his uh, wild world of relativity. Oh, absolutely. And it gets even weirder oh. when we delve into the relationship between mass and energy yeah, okay. in Einstein's universe. All right. Hit me with it. Okay. What does, uh, what does Feynman have to say about mass and energy that will turn my understanding of physics upside down? Well, you know how we're taught that mass is this constant property of an object. Right. Like your mass is your mass no matter what. Right. Exactly. Yeah. It's like one of those fundamental laws of physics they drill into you in school. Exactly. Uh -huh. But Einstein's theory of relativity throws a bit of a wrench in that neat little concept. Oh, no. Yeah. Don't tell me my physics teacher lied to me. Well, let's just say it's a bit more nuanced than we learned back in the day. Okay. According to special relativity, the mass of an object isn't actually constant. Okay. Instead, its mass increases as its velocity approaches the speed of light. Wait, seriously? Yes. So the faster something goes, the heavier it gets. That's right. Is it like it's suddenly absorbing more matter or something? Not exactly. It's not about gaining stuff in the traditional sense. Yeah. Instead, it has to do with the energy associated with motion. Okay. And how in the realm of relativity, mass and energy are two sides of the same coin. Okay, you're gonna have to unpack that a bit for me. Sure, so when an object gains kinetic energy, the energy of motion as it moves faster and faster, that energy doesn't just magically appear. Right. It's reflected in the object's overall mass. Okay. Think of it like this. The energy is becoming part of the object's identity. Okay. And that increase in energy manifests as an increase in mass. Right. We call this relativistic mass. So the energy is kind of like adding weight to right. the object, yes. even though it's not gaining any physical matter. You got it. Wow. And Feynman illustrates this beautifully Okay. with a thought experiment involving those tiny particles we've been talking about, protons. Right. Imagine two protons hurtling towards each other okay. at a significant fraction of the speed of light. Now, because of this increase in relativistic mass we just talked about, the faster those protons move, yeah. the heavier they effectively become. And if they collide. You get a much more energetic collision. Right. It's like the difference between two cars bumping fenders at low speeds versus a head-on collision at high speed. Right. The faster those protons are moving, the more energy they carry and the more dramatic the consequences of their collision. Okay, now I'm starting to see how this whole mass energy equivalence thing yes. ties into something we've all heard of. Yeah. That famous equation. E's enema. Exactly. It's the one equation that even people who haven't stepped foot in a physics classroom seem to know. Right. But what's often lost is the profound implication of Eve cystic. Okay. It's not just some abstract mathematical formula. It right. literally means that mass and energy are interchangeable. So it's not just about calculating energy. It's about understanding that energy and mass are, at their core, yes. different expressions of the same fundamental stuff. Right. And Feynman really drives this point home okay. when he talks about inelastic collisions. Okay. These are collisions where objects smash together and stick oh. like a ball of clay hitting a wall. Okay. What's fascinating is that in these inelastic collisions, the resulting object, the combined lump of clay, for example, yeah. can be heavier than the sum of the original objects. Hold on a minute. Yeah. That doesn't seem right. Right. Isn't mass supposed to be conserved? Right. Like, shouldn't the total mass before and after the collision be the same? That's what classical physics tells us. Okay. But Eames C. Fogg throws a wrench in that. Okay. What we learn from this equation is yeah. that the kinetic energy of those colliding objects, the energy of their motion, doesn't just disappear. Right. It has to go somewhere. Okay. And where it goes is into the mass okay. of the final combined object. So, okay. In essence, the kinetic energy is being converted into mass. Whoa. So you're telling me that energy itself actually has inertia. It has weight. It's a mind-blowing concept, but it's true, and it has profound implications for how we understand the universe. Right. Because, like, if energy has weight, yes, then 
yeah. that changes like everything. I, everything. But how we think about like the world works, right? For example, remember how we were talking about the atomic bomb earlier? Right. Scientists were able to estimate the potential energy release right. of an atomic bomb before one had ever been detonated. Wow. All thanks to Emacio. Wait, so you're saying that this equation, this seemingly abstract relationship between energy and mass, yes. has real world, and in this case, very significant consequences. Absolutely. Wow. By knowing the mass of a uranium atom right. and the masses of the atoms it splits into right. during fission, right. they could calculate the mass difference okay. using EMC sheet. Right. And that told them the potential energy release. That's incredible and a little terrifying, to be honest. <laughs> it makes you appreciate the sheer power contained within even the tiniest bits of matter, doesn't it? It really does. Yeah. It really does. But it also opens up a whole new world of possibilities. Right. If energy and mass are truly interchangeable, what does that mean for things like the Big Bang, the ultimate energy release, right. or for finding new and powerful energy sources in the future? It's like all of physics just got flipped on its head. <laughs> this deep dive into Feynman's lectures has really changed how I think about the universe. It's amazing, isn't it? It's amazing how much depth and complexity are hidden within these seemingly simple concepts yeah. of space, time, mass, and energy. It's truly humbling, isn't it? It is. It is. And the most exciting part is that there's always more to learn. Right. More to explore and more to discover as we continue to unravel the mysteries of the universe. Well said. Well said. Yeah. And on that note, we're going to have to leave it there. Okay. But uh, this has been another great deep dive. It has. Thank you for... Uh, for taking us down this rabbit hole with Feynman. My pleasure. It's always a wild ride, and uh, we'll catch you next time for another deep dive. Sounds good.